So this is our fourth uh, webinar this series, and this is on using the landscape approach to build urban water resilience. On behalf of the unit, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Saurabh Kumar Biswas, who is a landscape planner and a spatial analyst at Sasaki Associates in Boston. Saurabh has design and planning experience in multidisciplinary firms, including ACOM in San Francisco, SLA in Copenhagen, and Corgan in uh, Dallas and has prof professional experience with community engagement collaborations with Interborough Partners in Cambridge and BW Guggenheim Lab in Mumbai. The research experience in the Urban Theory Lab at Harvard University and Observer Research Foundation Mumbai. He also has teaching experience in KRV Institute of Architecture and Environment Studies, Bombay. He also has some publications in his name and the links to access them are available in your chat box. Uh, Saurav uses systems thinking and geospatial analysis to understand socio-ecological linkages uh, that impact urban resilience and uh, environmental sustainability and we're excited to have him uh, deliver the webinar today. Yeah, thank you very much Vaishnavi. Good, good afternoon to everyone who has joined and uh, thank you also to Dr. Raju Sekar and the entire team. Uh, it has been very encouraging to find out about the Urban Resilience Unit and the kind of initiatives you're taking forward. And I hope today's presentation um, helps in some of the initiatives that you're working on right now and for everyone else who has joined into the call. Uh, today, what I'm gonna be talking about is talking about urban resilience in terms of the concept of the landscape approach Okay, so there's many different ways to approach urban water resilience, but I will personally be talking about the landscape approach uh, that is particularly more spatial and more ecological in its thinking. <laughs> and I've structured my presentation in trying to define the landscape approach and then giving a very broad and quick overview of urban water resilience at the national scale and then zooming into two different case studies and the narrative will pretty much follow some of these multi-scalar implications that we should all be aware of as we engage in the idea of resilience. And so landscape approach is something that uh, we are promoting as part of the International Landscape Collaborative of which I'm a founding member. And we started this as an interdisciplinary platform at the Harvard Graduate School of Design that initially comprised of landscape architects, urban designers and planners who are now currently working or teaching in various parts of the world and what we as members share is a common interest in promoting the landscape approach as a way for us to be able to engage other disciplines, uh, not just planners, but also economists and ecologists and uh, development specialists, and to be able to find places to apply this approach and gain, gain that knowledge from experiences around the world. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize is we are promoting the landscape approach. We haven't pioneered the concept. And in fact, we are borrowing from a number of different ideas and disciplines that I will get to. Uh, but the essence of the landscape approach is pretty much in the name that we are placing the landscape and its socio-ecological linkages as the foundation for the design of urban form infrastructure, land management regimes, and territorial systems. Uh, you may know that the landscape approach is already kind of found some currency in the development sector already in the form of natural resource management and basin management. Um, but as designers and landscape architects, we are talk, thinking about what that means in terms of urbanization and for the design and planning of infrastructure, which is what we will focus on in this presentation. And we also think this is an important approach for our times. And this has been recognized very early on uh, by prominent ecologists like Eugene P. Odom is that many of our problems or most of our problems, if not all, that relate to uh, ecological degradation or for urban resilience or disaster risk reduction can be traced to the fact that we haven't taken a whole consideration of the landscape. Rather, we have a very short-term view of the places with which we interface. And... Uh, for a bit, what we mean by landscape is kind of the context over which basically human civilization unfolds. And these landscapes have been shaped over centuries by ecological processes. But what we find today in the age of the Anthropocene is that these landscapes are now increasingly being shaped by humanity as a geological force. And so we can no longer see landscapes uh, as a kind of pristine natural ecosystem, but as socio-ecological systems. And 
uh, ecologists and natural resource managers like Sutherland and Sayre uh, have this paper out that talks about these different principles of landscape approach, but where they essentially see that landscapes are the settings over which the wicked problems unfold, but also that the landscape approach can offer us a very strong framework with which we can begin to understand them. And many of these ideas have found its manifestation in landscape or ecological planning, uh, which is uh, a, a strain of thought and practice within the discipline of landscape architecture that had its lineage very early on uh, from its very beginnings through Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, but had been uh, almost codified and popularized in the book Design with Nature by Ian McCarg, where he popularized the approach of uh, the layering approach where you're able to get a more sophisticated understanding of the landscape over which we build. And he had a very strong emphasis in being able to properly understand the kind of ecosystem services and the physiological attributes of the landscape to determine what places are more suitable for growth, what places are more suitable for conservation. And we are kind of still building upon that lineage. A lot of these principles have been embedded in GIS, which uh, has been pioneered by a group of landscape architects uh, at Harvard, which is a very less known fact. And what we can also discuss later on is the legacy of landscape architecture, where the first uh, professional degree of urban planning in the US was essentially a master's in landscape architecture with a concentration in city development. And that the first urban planning program in the US essentially emerged from the faculty of landscape architects. And I think this disconnect that happened over time is something we can also get into during the discussions. And so the major uh, focus of ecological planning is how can we find ways in which we manage the changes or direct changes, fully acknowledging that human actions make the most impact on the landscapes. Are there ways in which we can attune uh, these human actions, whether they are settlement patterns or infrastructural in investments that are more in tune with natural processes. And the major takeaway from the design with nature as a book uh, was less about design or nature, but about the proposition with, which means how do we actually think about human or constructed or design systems working in cooperation with ecological and natural systems. Um, but the whole point of uh, the Anthropocene and the era in which we live in is that it's very hard to essentially talk about nature as its own uh, pristine and untouched entity. Uh, we can argue that almost the entire planet today has some kind of human impact or has been completely transformed by human impact. And it is for this reason that the landscape approach uh, derives a lot of its principles, or at least we do as practitioners, from two important disciplinary innovations, one of which is landscape ecology, uh, which essentially takes ecological principles uh, and tries to understand spatial patterns and position ecological processes as uh, how these patterns inter interact with each other on multiple scales. And so this discipline is especially interested in studying the structure and the function and the kind of changes that take place uh, not just in natural landscapes, but also semi-natural agricultural and urban landscapes. And uh, for us as planners, this is a particularly useful discipline because it allows us to have very basic uh, principles of ecology that are very scientifically rigorous, but it allows us to basically take those principles to many different contexts and evaluate through a very rapid assessment of the kind of structures that we see considering that most of the world today is a mosaic of many different land uses and not a single uh, natural entity unfolding over territories, is that uh, these kind of principles really allow us to engage a context and understand the ecological processes without uh, waiting for too much uh, original data. Um, and the second uh, school of thought emerges from socio-ecological systems, uh, which is another multidisciplinary initiative from ecologists and economists and geographers who understand the landscape like many other systems around the world are socio-ecological systems. They're complex, they're adaptive, and they, they make us think that humans are not 
separate from the natural uh, flows that occur around us, but that humans and non-human en entities are both interdependent and interact with each other. And we both have the capacity to completely transform uh, these environments, but also adapt to these changes. So the idea of resilience owes itself a lot from this type of thinking in socio-ecological systems. And um, in our book from the South, we have basically applied the landscape approach or shown a body of work that uses the landscape approach to either talk about metropolitan park systems um, and how we plan for territorial systems, especially arid landscapes, and how we can use the landscape approach to uh, read how regulations unfold over uh, many different systems like irrigation or urbanization. But in this particular presentation, I'll focus on what the landscape approach means in terms of uh, basins. And I think basins are one of the most effective landscape planning units that John Wesley Powell very beautifully described as a bounded hydrologic system that is defined by the way the water moves through the landscape. And John Wesley Powell was an, uh, a geologist who was a kind of pioneer in ecological thinking where he proposed that the way the Western US should be administratively divided is through the watershed boundaries. And unfortunately that's not uh, what happened, uh, but these ideas have still continued and that when we do take a project, whether it's a stream restoration or a river restoration or a canal, or even considering siting very big developments, we cannot consider these individual uh, entities independently of how it relates to the larger watershed that it is a part of. And uh, this has led to ideas like strategic basin planning, which is now uh, again gaining currency in the development sector, especially as they realize that uh, many of the ways in which we manage the resources have to be now aligned with uh, the hydrological interactions that take place within a basin. So what we are promoting is a kind of whole basin approach that lets you have a systemic understanding of the ecological and infrastructural systems uh, within those basins and how they relate to the kind of uh, demands and contestations that take place within those basins. Uh, the second aspect of the landscape approach uh, where we are going to apply the landscape approach in this presentation is nature-based solutions, uh, which is the idea that natural systems by themselves offer a ton of ecosystem services uh, that are important in terms of flood regulation, in terms of mitigating the effects of climate change, and that the way we should really think about our in infrastructural investments going forward, especially in the emerging ec economic context and also in light of the kind of stresses and shocks that we will face in the future is that rather than relying entirely on conventional gray infrastructure that we usually see in the form of building flood walls or creating culverts is that we should start leveraging different green systems that include forests, floodplains and soils to actually help us protect against floods and droughts. And what this also means for a developing context like ours is when you identify a huge infrastructural deficit and a financial deficit that goes with it. Uh, landscape or nature-based solutions are some of the most cost-effective uh, investments that actually grow more resilient over time uh, because these are natural solutions like mangroves and everything else. Um, so getting straight into what the landscape approach means for India, we're gonna start at the very national scale and begin zooming in. Um, one of the things to understand about just India as, as a nation is, and, and as a landscape, is that it's a very dynamic working landscape that is densely populated and highly influenced and dependent on the monsoon. So what you see here is uh, an image of the greenery that you see in India in May before the monsoons and what happens when the monsoon washes over the landscape and completely gives life to the entire territory turning everything apart from the Thar Desert into uh, different shades of green. And what we also see at a territorial scale is the kind of shifts that take place when different agricultural regimes uh, completely transform the landscape. So you can visibly register the harvest of winter rice across the country, and you can visibly register the harvest season when the wheat crops are in full bloom and you really see the Indo-Gangetic Plain emerge as this highly concentrated working landscape. 
And what we need to begin to do is find new ways or new vocabularies of visualizing these systems at the national scale. Uh, so this is a data set called Anthropogenic Biomes developed by the ecologist Earl Ellis. And he has the idea that we can no longer think of classifying our our territories in terms of land cover or even natural biomes, and that we should really think of them as what are the effects of human impact or human regimens of land management on top of natural biomes. And this is what he means by anthropogenic biomes. And these have categories ranging from the urban to dense settlements, which characterizes a lot of the Gangetic Plain uh, to rice villages and different mosaics of villages that either depend on rain or irrigation. And what you see in India's case is that we are a very densely populated landscape with multiple working regimes and very little of the landscape can be considered uh, wild. And that even some of the forested areas of India are highly inhabited. So anytime we think about conservation in India, we definitely have to take into account that this entire country or our territories are not just densely populated, but they are working landscapes with their own patterns of livelihood. And these livelihoods are directly more largely dependent on uh, the water resources that can be understood through their bounded basin. So we see the Ganga Basin, we see uh, the Kaveri and all these other big basins within uh, our boundaries. Uh, but what we also have to consider is that we have highly altered the kind of hydrological flows that usually define natural uh, watersheds. Uh, the gray that you see on the map is showing the density of uh, irrigation projects by sub-districts. And uh, you see definitely in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, but also through Rajasthan, that through the creation of multiple dams and canals, uh, we have essentially turned many of our watersheds into machines. Uh, similar to how uh, many engineers had called the Ganga, the Ganges water machine. And it is within this landscape that we have to think about water resource management. And uh, one interesting thing to uh, highlight here is that even though because of canals and because of dams, uh, we are now dependent on water resources that are outside our own watershed boundaries. So Delhi, for instance, depends on water resources in uh, Tehri dams that are thousands of kilometers away and many other cities in India do the same as well. Uh, the important thing to acknowledge is that in spite of these uh, disconnections and uh, mechanizations, we are still dependent and vulnerable to the landscape dynamics that happen within different watersheds. So even if our dam does not belong to our own watersheds anymore, they are still uh, susceptible to the kind of uh, sediment dynamics and uh, water hydrological dynamics specific to their place. And this acknowledgement or the lack of acknowledgement that we have to embed all these systems, whether it's natural or infrastructural, back to their watersheds is something that's highly missing in our discussions on the river linking project or any other kind of misguided infrastructural investments that we might think of going forward. What that also means is that uh, it's a very highly complex ecosystem within which we have to think about water resources. And most of India today has faces extremely high water stresses. So this is the data set from the World Resource Institute's uh, baseline water stress, uh, where the dark reds are showing extremely high water stress, which means that uh, we are taking out more than 80% of the resources that are going in in terms of water. And uh, that's very visible in the form of uh, Delhi and the entire DMIC region today. But also, as you have seen in the case of Chennai, that entire region is facing extremely high baseline water stress. And unless we do something about the way we withdraw or recharge these aquifers, we're in a, a whole lot of trouble. Um, and this map specifically comes out from my research with Rahul Mehrotra that we're gonna release in a book called Becoming Urban. And uh, what this map is showing is uh, priority urbanization areas. And here we are not just highlighting places that we already consider urban uh, or municipalities based on census data sets, but you're actually interested in how 
places have been changing over time. So whether it's changes in nighttime lights or changes in livelihood profiles to highlight uh, places that are rapidly growing or transforming. So we are not only interested in Delhi as a priority urbanization area, uh, but it's larger uh, urban agglomeration and the kind of corridors that start emerging within Punjab, within Kerala and outside of Chennai. And the reason we do this is to understand uh, what are the rapidly transforming areas of the country. And when we overlay that with some of the water stressed uh, data sets, what we find is some of the most rapidly urbanizing areas of India that includes uh, Delhi and its larger environments, Hyderabad, Bangalore, and Chennai are some of the most water stressed uh, urbanizing areas and that water might as well become a limiting factor for their growth. We're already kind of seeing that in Bangalore where there's consideration of halting new apartment constructions because of the lack of water. Um, and Kolkata and Chennai are the two of the cities that we will be zooming into next. Um, starting with Kolkata, that's a part of the Ganjaric Basin. And the Ganga Basin is uh, one of the most populous river basins and the most densely populated river basins, as you can see in here, where you are essentially part of a highly populated, consistently urban and rural territory. Uh, but what is concerning about the Ganga Basin is the fact that a lot of agriculture today, in spite of miles of canals and rivers, are dependent on the aquifer. And the aquifer itself has, is depleting at a very high rate, especially in the northern parts of the Gangetic Plain. Um, and that what we find in the Ganga Basin is not just a scarcity of freshwater resources, but the fact that uh, industrial and municipal pollution is actually jeopardizing uh, whatever available freshwater resources we might have. So what this is visualizing here is the uh, sewage that's generated by different municipalities within the Ganjaric Basin. Uh, Delhi, as you can see, is completely off the charts, followed by Kolkata, which is the second most biggest contributor of sewage. And what you also see here is the kind of water quality as the river systems move through Delhi or move through Kanpur or move through Varanasi. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because the next example that we're going to talk about, the East Kolkata wetlands, uh, leverages the landscape as one way to uh, treat uh, sewage. And it's one alternative to think about as we consider that the government has spent Karors and decades on Ganga action plans and Yamuna action plans, it's very little to show for it because uh, the entire focus has been on creating uh, sewage treatment plants within individual basins, not considering the fact that most of these cities aren't connected to the sewage system, but also that sewage treatment plants are some of the most expensive infrastructural investments that we can make. Uh, so are there alternative ways uh, that we actually can think about uh, sewage or waste recovery systems and whether the landscape comes into play in that as well. Uh, so the East Kolkata wetlands are what I would consider one of the most remarkable examples of socio-ecological systems. Uh, today it is ecologically functioning as a wetland, but what the, wet, what the East Kolkata wetlands essentially are, are thousands of uh, fish ponds. And these are fish ponds that have been incrementally built over decades, if not centuries, by communities of fishermen. And so what you see here are different types of harvesting ponds or rearing ponds that have different functions related to uh, fish growing. And they actually use sewage that comes through the canal from Kolkata as a way to nourish some of their hatchlings. Uh, and so what they're doing is using the ecosystem to not just filter the sewage, but creating a whole livelihood mechanism around uh, growing fish using that as a resource. And so for context, we will be talking about the East Kolkata wetlands with different scales of basins. So it's definitely part of the Ganga basins, but within that, the East Kolkata wetland is basically a filter between the Kolkata metropolitan region and the Sundarbans, which is one of the most uh, important mangrove ecosystems in the world. And because Kolkata moves most of its sewage eastwards, if it wasn't for the East Kolkata wetlands, uh, the city would have had a much more outsized impact on the health of the Sundarbans 
which is one of the most important barriers uh, against sea level rise and other effects that we might see on the city through climate change. And what the wetlands do is they actually process more than 750 million liters of sewage per day, which is almost more than half the total amount of sewage that the Kolkata metropolitan region generates. And considering the fact that their own treatment capacity is only about 200 MLDs, uh, the existence of the East Kolkata wetlands is important, not just for the city, but for its territory around it. Um, and what the wetland is about are, as I mentioned, there are over 200 sewage fed fisheries and small scale farms and a host of other different e economies. Um, but the thing that I want to point out when I bring up the idea of socio-ecological systems is that uh, very little of this wetland would exist the way it is now without the intervention of these fishermen. Uh, so a bit of an ecological history to the wetlands is that most of these wetlands that you see today, the Bidyadhari wetlands, were fed by a river system that has moved more eastward over time. So the whole ecosystem used to be a salt marsh ecosystem because it still had a linkage to the Bay of Bengal. Uh, but in the late 1800s, the British had set up the East Kolkata wetlands area as a dumping ground for its solid waste and made sure that it could move all the sewage towards the east. So Kolkata, Dr. Dhrubajuti Ghoshu actually uh, recognize the East Kolkata wetlands for what it is, considered Kolkata uh, an ecologically subsidized city because it had one river from which it could extract drinking water and be able to move its sewage into a different river system. So it was basically surrounded by two river systems where it drew water from here and then moved its sewage through canals into another river system. Uh, so when the sewage canal started going through the wetlands. It used to be a salt marsh ecosystem that already had its community of fishermen. And as the river moved away and it lost the connection to the sea, and as the freshwater sewage started coming in, the fishermen essentially adapted to this changed landscape. And so what they started doing was creating uh, different types of holding ponds and leveraging this infrastructural project that was built by the British and created their own networks of canals and gateways to bring that sewage into their ponds. Um, and you can read my article on uh, the processes that actually take place within these ponds. Uh, what happens is within these fisheries, they have a whole hierarchy of ponds within which they let in uh, the sewage and there's different levels at which they're able to regulate the entry of the sewage so it doesn't create a, a kind of anoxic or dead wetlands, but instead they're kind of regulating the level of sewage to where the fish can actually take in the nutrients that are from the sewage. And what they have done is created a whole ecosystem of plants and uh, wetland species that are able to filter the water over time. Um, and then they're able to move these fish to different ponds over time. Uh, I would urge you to kind of uh, read the essay or read more about the system to understand some of the intricacies or we can bring it up during the question and answer sessions. Uh, but essentially some pictures from this suggest that this is the main canal that uh, the city maintains to this day and it was built by the, the British and there is a whole system of locks that regulates where the sewage enters or does not enter and these are infrastructure that were built by city authorities, but the next hierarchy of infrastructures that involve these uh, bamboo gates or these filtration devices have been built by different communities, leveraging this centrally built infrastructure to create this kind of their own ecosystem and their own hydrological regimes. And so what you see are different hierarchies of canals that have been built by them or these kind of buns that they maintain over time and all the species that you see within the ecosystem are actually helping or aiding either their agricultural livelihoods or the practice of fish rearing. And you can see them using very low tech, uh, low technological solutions to regulate the sewage. And so what you see here is a kind of amalgamation of high technology built by the city uh, uh, combined with low tech technologies built by the fishermen, but also decades of 
traditional practices where they are very attuned with the kind of flows that happen. So they're able to understand how much sewage to put into the wetland before it becomes toxic to the fish or how much to regulate before it becomes toxic to the ecosystem. And we need to then understand the East Kolkata wetlands, not just as a wetland that's an environmental system or as an infrastructural system that's giving Kolkata its ecosystem services, but as a kind of social network that's uh, sustaining the landscape and that without their interventions, the fishermen, the boat repairmen, uh, this would not operate the way it is because Kolkata today doesn't really consider the effects of sewage on the landscape, but you have this whole community of fishermen and its producer associations that have a livelihood interest in being able to regulate the sewage to make the wetland productive. Um, but unfortunately, there are limits to how much traditional practices can take you, especially in light of the new kind of development pressures that the city, that the wetland faces. So over time, as the city of Kolkata has rapidly grown, we are starting to see a lot of the new development happening on the peripheries that are beginning to surround the East Kolkata wetlands. And today, the wetlands themselves are recognized in the form of a boundary over which uh, the EKWMA or the management authority has jurisdiction, but unfortunately it's not a jurisdiction that has many executive or punitive powers. And so while it's acknowledged as a protected area, there's a lot of transformations that are happening right along the edges of the wetlands, but also internally within the wetlands as villagers start converting their agricultural lands or even their wetland lands into new forms of development. And the result of this is not just direct encroachment of the wetlands, but also what are the effects of the fact that a new highway has been constructed as a new corridor of development and what the pollutant runoff from those highways mean and what are the impacts of new developments or new construction that generates runoff that go into the landscape or what are the impacts of groundwater extraction that are coming up in these new towns and what kind of impact would that have on the wetland itself? And so what we are proposing here is that when you use the landscape approach to understand how to manage the future of this wetland, you cannot be thinking merely about the boundary that has been drawn around the villages that consist the wetland, but you have to understand the kind of sub-basin that contributes the hydrology towards the wetland, because in the end, you have to understand the wetland as a hydrological system at first, but also as a system that is highly interlinked to the city because of the infrastructural investments that have been made. And so what we believe is that with the landscape approach, we should be able to find solutions that, that allow us to think of new land uses so we can resolve competing demands on the, on the resource of land and water. And that through landscape planning, we should be able to integrate many ecological principles into spatial planning tools so we can accommodate this demand, considering especially that the development trajectories of the city today are actually jeopardizing the ecological functions and the livelihoods today. And through landscape planning, we can actually come up with a more spatially explicit uh, set of rules that consider those impacts on the ecosystem, but also that we can identify what stakeholders can be responsible for mitigating or avoiding ecological impact. One of the first steps at, at acknowledging the wetland as a hydrological system is that uh, to understand what sub-basin impacts uh, the wetland. So this has been a very preliminary analysis of surface water flows that go into the wetland. Uh, but what the wetland needs today is a kind of more deeper analysis of the different kind of point sources and diffuse sources of water that ends up in the, land, in the wetlands today. And so when you have an idea of that, you're also cognizant of the fact that whatever development happens here has an indirect or direct impact on the wetland itself. And I propose this kind of sub-basin boundary within which to kind of start that study so we can have an an inventory of the different surface and groundwater influxes that currently feed the land wetlands today. But we also have to understand that some of the biggest conveyors of water 
within the wetlands today are our constructed eco, uh, constructed infrastructures and also what effects do other infrastructures like highways in terms of their pollutant runoff or even new developments that are a leather factory that are downstream of the wetlands have as pollutants and what are the impacts of constructed systems on the wetlands. And most importantly, we have to understand what are the different political jurisdictions within which this proposed sub-basin has been drawn out. Uh, so this basin itself includes uh, 118 villages, it spans two districts, it contains four municipalities and a new development area. And what we are trying to make the point here is that even when you identify a landscape unit that makes sense to manage or conserve uh, an ecological systems is how do you align multiple jurisdictions to manage that ecosystem. And I think in the Q&A, we can get into what alternate models we can come up with. But here, what I want to highlight is that there are certain villages in, uh, in and around the wetland today that might be more invested in the conservation of the wetland and that as urbanization comes in, we see a shift in livelihoods that are no longer dependent on the resources of the wetland itself. So we're already seeing the kind of Eastern half becoming fully urban in terms of its economic profile. And this is also where we are seeing a lot of land con conversions happening. And so to really understand the political landscape as well as the hydrological and the infrastructural landscape is important to properly conserve these wetlands. Um, and the other thing is bringing in the landscape ecology principles to understand what are the different land uses and what are the patterns of new development that are happening around the wetland. And the fact that today the wetland boundary does not even have an ecological buffer to manage the kind of runoff that feeds the wetlands today. And that most of the boundaries, especially to the west or of the of the wetland that interfaces the city have been completely built up. And it's only a matter of time that we may or may not be able to defend those borders. Uh, so this is something, this is a very remarkable ecosystem that has very few precedents around the world, where we are finding that communities can leverage the landscape as well as gray infrastructure to provide an ecosystem services at a much affordable rate that the city can afford today. And also that this kind of hybrid landscapes are providing livelihoods that we couldn't imagine uh, in a happening in an emerged way, in a designed way, and that these wetlands are a result of very different interactions and dynamics that have emerged over time. Uh, and this is not something that's easy to replicate. And what we are finding is that we have very little appreciation for these ecosystems and that we are actually having a hard time finding ways to simply maintain this very important ecosystem. And so some of the takeaways from this part of the presentation is that we could be looking at very innovative ways in which we can couple social and ecological systems with hard infrastructure. <laughs> Uh, but also that when it comes to the conservation of important ecosystems, we might have to think beyond some of the basic boundaries that we have set up to protect them and really account for the different political, social, and infrastructural pressures that many of the wetlands around India face today. Um, and as we scale up from one basin to another, we can really start to think of the linkages of the East Kokhla wetlands, not just to the city, but to these whole other ecosystems of wetlands that are currently unrecognized today, but it's bound to play a very important role in the future as climate change and sea level rise threatens the Kolkata metropolitan region. And uh, now we will move to Chennai. I just wanna see how much time I have. Uh, so what I want to show in Chennai is that a lot of the work here has been uh, summarized in this handbook. Uh, but what I will do right now today is kind of give you a very quick run through of how we conceptualize the project and what the project means for urban water resilience. So the issue in Chennai is mainly that while it has ample water resources in terms of the incoming monsoons, by the summer seasons, uh, you've already seen the city go through cycles of high floods that happened in 2015, followed immediately by cycles of drought. And so this kind of thin cyclical crises are basically results of not 
uh, understanding the way in which the water flows through the landscape. And what we have seen in Chennai is a kind of disruption and, and degradation of many of the landscapes that had sustained the water resources for the city. And what you see here is the city limits in 1991 compared to the city limits in 2018. Uh, the city has grown multiple times and will continue to grow into these landscapes. Uh, what you see here is the transformation of the Pallikarnai Marsh from green to completely surrounded by built fabric. And what you're also trying to highlight here is the fact that uh, these kind of water bodies and green areas essentially work as sponge landscapes and that in the dry season, they have a certain configuration, but they're actually prepared to absorb a lot more water. And as they're surrounded by urban development, they suddenly lose that capacity. So what you're seeing here, again, is the kind of disruption of built patterns on top of ecological systems. And what that has resulted in is a completely new hydrological phenomenon. In nature, you don't see much of runoff in the hydrological cycle, but as you build up within the natural systems, Almost half of your water has resulted in runoff, which is what actually contributes to the floods. And very little of the water actually infiltrates the aquifers, which is what leads to uh, the drought cycles. So uh, what we did as part of this presentation that we made to uh, different engineers in PWD or CRRP is to convince them that because of this new hydrological infrastructure that actually increases a lot of the runoff right after uh, a rainfall event is that you can either invest a whole lot of money in increasing your stormwater capacity to be able to accommodate that runoff, or you can find ways to balance some of the runoff by introducing a green infrastructure approach to essentially bring back the green cover into the city and be able to reduce the runoff amounts. And so what you're doing is creating a much more low cost, effective, uh, infrastructural approach that considers the watershed, not just as a catchment area within which we are collecting water to throw away into the sea, but where we are actually considering the natural greenery and the water bodies within the watershed and leveraging that to come up with a kind of infrastructural network that essentially reduces the runoff, but also increases the, uh, the filtration. The other aspect that we wanted to point out is that traditional stormwater infrastructure, which is a huge uh, sector or a huge portion of municipal investment and cost, is always hidden away. And the only time that citizens actually register these infrastructures is when they fail. And we're talking about a new different approach, the landscape approach that actually brings these infrastructural things forward by integrating landscape elements in the form of trees and detention basins. Uh, the other point that we also want to carry forward is that you have to start understanding the different basins within which the urbanization is taking place. So currently, the urban footprint has reached the, the, the CMDA boundary, but we need to start thinking about what are the impacts as the city expands forward into areas that have not yet been developed. And some of the reasons why the Adya River overflows during the floods is because a lot of these upland areas that used to be green are no longer green. Uh, but we're also noticing a lot of flooding in these parts of Chennai simply because they used to be low-lying areas that are now currently part of the IT corridor. So this kind of lack of understanding of the basin dynamics and also the understanding of the kind of landscape configurations uh, have been quite detrimental and actually increased the flood risk for the city. And so what we kind of proposed here was a very uh, simple idea of four different principles that we can adopt to actually improve urban water resilience. And they can be summarized in the form of protect. You have to protect the blue-green systems that are currently playing a very important role. And we have to find ways to be able to delay stormwater from actually overwhelming the drains and canals and rivers. We have to find ways to be able to store these water resources in a decentralized way within our homes, within our streets, and also find ways to release that aquifer over time so we can recharge the groundwater. And the rest of the document essentially visualizes in very simple ways what it means to not do anything if you just let uh, urbanization happen or what we could do to maybe manage or prioritize 
areas of conservation and leverage the natural water flows of the natural networks to move and convey water while recharging the aquifer. And so what we are promoting is this idea of the sponge basin, where the sponge basin is a combination of our ability to protect what we are calling sponge landscapes and our ability to implement a network or a landscape infrastructure network, because what we are experiencing here is not not just the natural ecosystems that have a number of different ecosystem services, uh, but a completely transformed ecosystem that has been built up. And so what are some of the ways in which we can discuss this uh, later? What are some of the ways in which we can actually bring back uh, hydrological functions of natural ecosystems within our streets and our open spaces and our buildings? And so we kind of created a toolkit uh, that talked about what are some of the things that the municipality could do, because the people are doing quite a lot in terms of rainwater harvesting, in terms of recharge wells, but what are some of the things that the PWD or the road departments or the parks departments could start doing to make the urban areas uh, more resilient and, op and almost hydrologically operate like a natural ecosystem. So uh, you can find the links, a whole toolkit of different uh, different interventions, and I'm just kind of giving you an overview of how we organized it. We talked about a very detailed sections and an axon of how they work, but who are the implementing stakeholders, what kind of functions they have. And we do the same thing for the network of open spaces, and we did the same for buildings. And we kind of ended up with a summary table showing where different kinds of interventions are applicable, what are the kind of functions they do, and what kind of soil types are more applicable for. Uh, and the reason we set it out in this way is because we don't actually have the data to determine where exactly some of these infrastructures are more feasible. But what we have set out is going forward as a city government, you have to first recognize they have all these basins that you can have to comprehensively plan for, but also that we need these type of data sets today to be able to create a landscape infrastructure potential map within which we can then start evaluating where we can prioritize the creation of landscape infrastructure. So what are some priority areas that are publicly owned that are identified by the community that are highly impervious? So we can actually go from the scale of the basin to the scale of the ward or the zones and working with zonal engineers to be able to implement this. And one case study of this that is very great has been the Copenhagen Cloudburst Plan that was developed by a whole host of disciplines for economists to hydrologists to come up with a framework. And they are now beginning to implement different aspects of it um, in Copenhagen. And what we did in Chennai is that even though our project was uh, this canal project uh, in the Palikarnai Basin, we actually created, developed a basin-wide view of understanding what are the low points and the high points, what are the green systems and the blue systems, and how different zones intersect within the within that sub-basin. And as we zoom in, actually contextualizing our sites within what are the wards that surround it and what are the institutions that surround it, so that when we do come up with a kind of framework for what streets could be upgraded to become sponge streets or what open spaces could be upgraded to become sponge open spaces or what buildings can be upgraded to become sponge buildings. We are fully aware of institutional capacities like IIT here or different IT parks here, but also acknowledge that there are different words with their respective zonal engineers that we have to interface with and that we have to think of a kind of network of projects that can be implemented incrementally over time by different stakeholders, but that when you put forward a kind of framework, uh, you're basically building up resilience over time. And here we kind of identified what are some of the places that you can start these priority pilot projects and what they might look like. And I don't know if I might, I don't think I'll have time to kind of go through what we did in the canal itself, but. I will just kind of flip through how we presented the material in terms of what we do with canals today, which is kind of wall them off. You have no access. You're actually increasing our risk to kind of a more uh, landscape approach of opening up the canal over time. 
but we were actually very careful about where we could do certain things and where we could not. So we kind of inventoried what different configurations of the landscape of the canal profile is possible and talked about what that means over time. So we are convincing the city that they need to make this kind of a big move, but this move kind of sits within a host of short-term, medium-term, and long-term actions that start with the implementation of the sponge network within the neighborhood so that we can manage the runoff within our urban areas to then begin to open up the canal and open up the slopes so that it has more capacity and it's able to absorb the water. And that over time, we're kind of improving the kind of landscape interface or the public space interface around the canal. And over time, using this new uh, built or improved landscape as a leverage to create uh, new types of housing that actually capture the value of this landscape um, and kind of positioning these small projects within a timeline that over time builds up to create uh, the network that our cities need today. Um, and so within the site that we kind of worked at, we were showing over time how all those principles come together in a kind of small undeveloped plot where we start first start begin with the short term projects that upgrade our streets through the different kind of toolkits that we had shown before and that we might be able to activate the short term, the canal edge through tactical urbanism, but we have kind of zoomed in almost from the scale of the basin and the country to the scale of the street section. So we can actually connect very high level principles to very implementable sections that can speak to the engineer. And I think this is one aspect of the landscape approach that we're very interested as design professionals to explore is that as designers and as planners, we're actually able to traverse multiple scales from the territorial all the way down to the street section to be able to show what these large scale principles or what these large scale efforts mean at the site scale and how if we are strategically thinking about infrastructural investments, we're not just able to improve the resilience of the city, but we're also able to uh, open up potentials for new development that does not displace, but integrates the existing uh, residents um, and that we are creating a kind of landscape armature over which multiple stakeholders can come together to improve the livability of the city. And so what you see here is a kind of uh, fully built out realization of many of those principles that when there's time it has to respond in the, in the time of a cloud bursts or extreme storm events, all these different components can work together to improve the resilience uh, of the city. And we can also kind of see that in a section that people can consider it as something that can be built out over time. And here we visualize what that means when that single profile or that single pilot project is replicated across the landscape and that that intervention is part of a whole network or suite of different interventions that take place within the urban fabric. And we are then able to visualize what it means to open up the canal edge that is more resilient, but also more active. Uh, what it means to restore the canal uh, ecologically and actually leverage that to spur new development. And what that means in the form of uh, new neighborhoods that are more aligned to the ecological and hydrological flows. And so to conclude, what we have done here is kind of set very large scale principles that are exemplified in the landscape approach and in our sponge basin principles of protect, delay, store and release that inform every level of planning, starting with the framework plans uh, where this is very important because even though it's a very, it's not a very costly endeavor, it's a very cost effective endeavor because when you're able to create a timeline for multiple infrastructures over time and how they interact with each other, you're able to basically multiply your dividends or the resilience dividend as you call it. And we're particularly excited about what that means in the form of visions, because we see visions as a way to make these principles and framework plans tangible. So even though we know that this might not be built out the way we have visualized here, there are still very compelling visualizations that let people have a more concrete discussion, actually trigger different forms of consultations and collaborations that evolve the vision. So we can finally end up implementing some of these strategic plans.
and this might end up informing the framework plan as and when it starts implementing projects in a kind of cyclical process. So uh, to end, what I want to emphasize is when we talk about the landscape approach and when we talk about urban water resilience, uh, we need to be cognizant of multiple scales from the territorial and the national all the way down to uh, the city, to the street, to the drainage section. I mean, one of the most important things we want to do through our projects and through the maps that I've made is that by simply showing them what the landscape unit is, is a political act. Uh, because many of these uh, basins or many of these landscape attributes have not been eliminated the way that it has been before. And the challenge there is that, as is the case in many parts of the world, is that administrative units uh, do not overlap with landscape units like watersheds for certain, uh, but also many different ecological systems go beyond administrative boundaries. So the, the current slide that you have here is uh, where we are showing what the different principles are, and they of course come out from the landscape approach, the principles of protect, delay, store, release, that have very specific actions, uh, need to be implemented by very different uh, administrative bodies. Um, so in the scale, in, let's say in the case of Kolkata, what I did was when I identified a landscape unit, I'm also making the effort to identify the many different administrative bodies that have to come together. So they might come together in the form of the way new development authorities are set up, where suddenly you're kind of pulling together uh, discrete administrative units to have a strategic direction forward, or uh, they become part of uh, the Metropolitan Development Authority's jurisdiction. Uh, what we are seeing in the case of Chennai actually is uh, that many of these landscape attributes go grow beyond today's boundary of the CMDA, uh, but that is not the case for, let's say, Chennai Metro Waters jurisdiction, who are actually in charge of all the water bodies that supply Chennai today. Um, and so we see in the case of India, because our cities are not as empowered in the form of mayors while the state governments are, is that there actually is the potential when we do highlight these issues for the state government to be quite a lot more proactive in what it means for rapidly urbanizing regions interfacing with very urban landscapes that deserve protection. Um, but also we kind of see a new role for uh, districts and district plans to understand what that means. So first of all, in, in Chennai's case, what we are highlighting here is how different bodies have to come together to implement a certain principle, uh, but also at the very small scale, what it means is when we promote this idea of the sponge street, uh, where a tree has to be strategically built with the stormwater infrastructure, we actually don't have the capacity for the park system that's in charge of trees to work closely with the Department of Stormwater to be able to implement that project. But by visualizing it and showing them that this is what we should aspire to, they can at least know on what basis they should have that conversation. Uh, one thing that we achieved through our presentation was when we showed the kind of opening up of the canal, whether it happens or not, a lot of people acknowledge that it needs to happen. And when PWD and CRRT, which is the Chennai River Restoration Trust, were both in the same room, they started having a productive, sometimes combative discussion on what it means to tear down the canal, who will tear down the wall, who's gonna be in charge of the maintenance. Uh, but these are conversations that we can only have when we have visualized the scope of the landscape unit, when we have visualized uh, what it means to implement a certain thing. And most importantly, when we have communicated the fact that uh, you actually don't have many other choices. Uh, this is, uh, you are facing a number of different crises that require you to completely rethink your infrastructural investments. And so that is one way where I think uh, the landscape approach should be strategic in understanding these political uh, nuances, but that it's a very necessary thing to be able to 
visualize and present and be provocative. So we can actually get the administrative uh, combinations or coordinations that we need urgently at this time. 